Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Converting Units of Mass and Density. So before we do any problems, let's take just a minute to talk about what is mass and density, right? So mass is basically a measure of how many atoms you have in a substance and also what type of atom you have, right? Because um, different substances are made of different atoms. So lead and you know uh, gold or lead and hydrogen, the intrinsic atoms that make up that substance, they have different numbers of protons and so there, there's different amounts of mass in each of the different types of atoms on the periodic table, right? But also the mass of a substance is, so it's related to the type of atom in there and it's also related to how many of them you have. So the more atoms you have, the more massive the object is gonna be. Now we generally feel mass as kind of like when gravity acts on it and pulls it down towards the Earth, or even if you're in space and you're not any, anywhere near a black hole or any other uh, massive body in the universe, you're way out in deep space, you're not anywhere orbiting anything, right? Uh, when you take a object and push on it, you'll be able to, to in, in, to feel its mass because it's going to resist your motion. If you can imagine a spacecraft, a gigantic spacecraft in outer space, um, it it's, doesn't have any force of gravity pulling on it if it's way out in the middle of the universe, but if you try to push on it, it's gonna resist your, it's gonna resist your push. So that's called inertia, and we're gonna talk about that a lot later. So the best description for mass that we really have, mass is the quality that we assign to a, uh, a, an object when it resists our, 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 mo our, our push, our forces, when it resists its change and its motion. So if I try to push it, it's gonna resist. Now eventually it'll start moving and you can get it going pretty fast, but initially it's gonna resist a change in its motion. And that's what we call inertia. So that's, in fact, it's called inertial mass when we talk about spacecraft, right? But on Earth, we're not in space. We have uh, everyday experience with things that fall down and we know that massive objects are pulled more strongly towards uh, you know, the center of the earth because of gravity. And so we use that in, in terms of physics all the time. So in terms of what is mass, it is related to how many atoms are in the object and also the type of atom because not all atoms have the same intrinsic mass in terms of the number of protons there. The mass of an atom is almost all concentrated in the nucleus with the protons and the neutrons. The electrons on the outside shell of the atom, they contribute almost nothing to the mass, but they do have charge. That's a different animal for a different day. So that's mass. Mass is you know, how much you know, uh, it resists our, our, our push when we try to push it around in space and also uh, gravitational uh, a pull, gravitational force. Now density, we're gonna talk about in a minute when we get to the second problem. Density is a measure of the mass of an object but then divided by the volume of the object. So if I take a, uh, a, you know, a, some leaves, let's say, and which are very, very sparse, and I put them in a container, we would think we would say that it has a low density. The, the leaves have mass, but they're over a very large volume, so everything's spread out, and so the concentration of the mass, that's really what it is. Density is like the concentration of the mass. How concentrated is the mass? Because if I take those, those leaves, which are spread out, and I compress it down into a ball, and then I put it in a machine and compress it down further, and I put it into an accelerator in a, in a gigantic facility and, and really get the atoms and, and really, really compress them, then we would say, once it's very, very small and occupies a small volume, it has the same mass. We've compressed that mass into a very small volume, and so we say it's a higher density. You can also think of it as a higher concentration of the mass. So density is mass divided by volume because it incorporates the mass of the object compared to how much space that object occupies. It's like a concentration of the mass. High density means a very high concentration of mass. Like if you compress something, very low density is when you just have mass that's more spread out uh, occupying a larger volume. So we say that that's a lower density situation. All right, with that information out of the way, I'm gonna solve our first problem. It says the Earth's mass is approximately 5.980 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And the average mass of the atoms that the Earth is comprised of is 40 U, and the unit of U is the atomic mass unit. Determine the number of atoms in the Earth. Now you might say, whoa, 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 we haven't talked about atomic mass units and you're throwing this U out. You're gonna have to roll with it a little bit here in the beginning, right? So I know that some of you have already taken chemistry, some of you have already taken some physics, some of you know what an atomic mass unit is, and some of you have no idea. So you're just gonna have to, like I say, roll with it a little bit. The unit of SI unit of mass in the SI system is the kilogram. That's what we use all the time, so we can you know, make, turn it into grams or kilograms or micrograms or whatever. 
Um, but when we really talk about atoms, a kilogram is just a really, really, really small unit for an atom. So we have another unit that we usually talk about in nuclear physics and also in chemistry called the atomic mass unit. And suffice to say, an atomic mass unit is basically the mass of a proton. And that's, that's all I'm going to say about it, okay? Because you go into exactly how it's defined and all of that, but you can basically say that one atomic mass unit is basically one proton. Right, and it, it, ha, it, it and so we say that the average mass of, of the atoms that comprise the Earth is 40 atomic mass units because some of the atoms in the Earth have very, uh, very are very light. They like hydrogen and helium. They're much lower than 40 atomic mass units. But then we have a lot of metals and other things that are actually have more mass than 40, and so the average is 40. So it's kind of like an indirect measure of the number of protons in the atoms. That's kind of like your your, your very general idea. But for the purpose of this, what we're trying to do is determine the number of atoms in the Earth. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to take that 40 atomic mass units. So you can call it 40.0, and we're going to use the symbol U, but this stands for AMU, which is atomic mass units. And let's convert this to kilograms. And when we convert it to kilograms, and knowing the mass of the Earth in kilograms, we can divide and figure out how many atoms roughly exist in the Earth, which is what we're trying to find, the number of atoms that the, comprise, that the Earth is comprised of. So let's take this uh, here. Now, if you open up a physics book to the first page, you'll probably see some conversion factors, and one of them will be the conversion between atomic mass units and kilograms. And what you will find out is that one of these atomic mass units is equal to 1.66 times 10, wait for it, to the negative 27 kilograms. So you gotta remember, one atomic mass unit is like the it's like the mass of a proton. So it's gonna be a really, really, really small number of kilograms. And so you can see you're moving the decimal point 27 positions to the left here. And so it's a, in terms of kilograms here. Now, atomic mass units cancels, and so we have the unit of the kilogram left over. So if we take 40 and we multiply by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27, we get a number that's 6.64. Uh, times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Now, what is this? What, is, what does this calculation mean? This is the average mass of an atom on Earth in the unit of kilograms. The average mass in terms of atomic mass units is 40 AMU or atomic mass units because on average, they, they have, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say 40 protons because there's neutrons involved as well. You see the, the mass of a proton and a neutron are very close, but they're not quite the same. So there's a lot of little details here, right? But basically, in the nucleus of all the atoms in the Earth, the average mass is 40 AMU, which means it's basically protons and neutron, neutrons added together. They, in general, Earth has 40 of those species added together, protons plus neutrons, because all of the mass is concentrated in the center. So if we take the mass in terms of atomic mass units, we convert it to kilograms, then this is the mass of, of the average atom on the Earth. This is what it is. Okay, so how do we find the number that we have? Well, we know that Earth has 5.980 times 10 to the positive 24th power kilograms of mass. But then every atom has an average mass of this. So if we divide in here, we're going to find how many atoms we have. 6.64 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Notice that this is kilograms of mass of the Earth and kilograms of mass of, a, of the average atom, so the kilograms are cancel, so the answer that we get is not gonna be in units of kilograms. So if we take 5.980 times 10 to the positive 24, divide by 6.64 times 10 to the negative 26, we're gonna get 9.01 times 10 to the, wait for it, power of 49, and this is gonna be atoms. Right? Why? Because we know the mass of the entire Earth, and we know the mass of the average atom on Earth. So if we divide it in, this is how many atoms we have to have. It's a big number. You move this 49 decimal places to the right, it's a gigantic number. I don't have a word for it. 9.01 times 10 to the 49 atoms. Now keep in mind, this is not a chemistry class, uh, and we are going to get to atomic mass units later when we talk about nuclear physics. So we are going to talk about it. But in this very beginning here, I left out a lot of details when I talk about atomic mass units, mass of a proton, and all this stuff. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for what it is um, because I want to. But uh, don't get so wrapped up in what does that mean? How was that? Because we haven't gotten there yet. 
And even if you don't know what an AMU is, literally if all you know that this is a unit of mass and that this unit of mass is equal to this in kilograms, then you convert and then you divide, you can still solve the problem without even knowing what an AMU is. And you know, that's, that's what we have to do here in the beginning sometimes. All right, problem two deals with not just mass, but also density. It says, a piece of lead has a mass of 23.940 grams and a volume of 2.100 centimeters cubed or cubic centimeters. Determine the density of the lead and convert this value into SI units, which are kilograms per cubic centimeter. So straight up, the first thing we want to do is, is, is calculate the density. Now, the density, I didn't write the equation down before, but I told you verbally that the density is a, 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 a Greek letter that we use called rho. It looks a little bit like a P, but you don't write it like that. You kind of, I'll go down here and demonstrate it. You kind of go under and make a little hook. Under, make a little hook. Under, make a little hook. Under, it's, so it's, it's just a little weird little symbol, but it's kind of fun to write. And now that I do it a bunch, I'm gonna make some weird ones, right? So basically rho, which is the symbol that we use for density, we use rho for density of, of anything really, but even later on, we use it for charge density, all kinds of densities. But here we're talking about the density of mass compared to volume. And so the density of a substance is equal to its mass divided by its volume. And so you're gonna get that in units of, in general, kilograms per volume, whatever it is, cubic meters or whatever. But in this problem, we weren't given kilograms in cubic meters, we were given the volume in terms of what? Let's calculate it. In, uh, we'll put a little hook in the end there. We were told that the piece of lead has a mass of 23.940, and that was grams. And the volume was 2.100 cubic centimeters. So you have mass per unit volume, grams per cubic centimeter. But I'm just telling you that sometimes density will be given to you in kilograms per cubic meter. Sometimes it'll be given to you in grams per cubic centimeter. Sometimes it'll be given to you, in, instead of cubic centimeters, it'll be called uh, milliliters or even liters because liter is a unit of volume also, right? So we, we have different ways of describing, but you always have to have a mass on top and you always have to have a volume on the bottom. That is something that has to be always true. So when we calculate this, the density, when we take 23.940 and we divide by 2.100, we get 11.40 and that's grams per cubic centimeter, all right? Grams per cubic centimeter. Now this is the density of this substance. It's how many grams exist in a little cubic centimeter. So if I literally were to measure a cubic centimeter, literally make a cube in space where every side of the cube was one centimeter, and this side was also one centimeter. And what other side is left? I guess this side right here is one uh, centimeter. Then this makes a cube in space with one centimeter on each side. That's called a cubic centimeter. And then what this is saying is that the density of this substance has 11.4 grams that exist inside that little cubic centimeter. If I compress it more and, and squeeze the atoms closer together, it's gonna have a higher density because the same mass will go into a smaller volume. If you make the volume smaller, but you keep the mass the same, then the density gets higher. As you compress things, you make the density higher because you're squeezing it into a smaller and smaller volume. So here is the density, but we want to convert this density into SI units. So let's put down 11.40 grams on the top and cubic centimeters on the bottom. But we know we're gonna convert this. So instead of writing it as cubic centimeters, I'm gonna write it as centimeters times centimeters, times centimeters. That way I don't get confused. I taught you how to do this a long time ago when we did our dimensional analysis, right? So I wanna to get to uh, the units of kilograms here. And I know that 1,000 of these grams is the same thing as one of these things called kilograms. So the grams will cancel. So now I have kilograms per cubic centimeter. So I've got the kilograms right, now I gotta change the centimeters into meters. I want units of kilograms per cubic meter. I know that 100 of these centimeters is equal to one meter. So this will cancel with this, but I've got more. So I've got to do it again. 100 centimeters is one meter. And 100 centimeters is one meter. And now I see that uh, here, the centimeters here cancel. This one here will cancel with this one. This one here will cancel with this one. Now what do I have left? I have kilograms on the top, and when these are multiplied, the meters will become cubic meters on the bottom. So 11.40, divide that by 1,000, 
then times 100, then times 100, then times 100 again, and then what you will get is 1.140 times 10 to the fourth kilograms on top, cubic meters on the bottom. Meters times meters times meters uh, on the bottom. Now you don't have to blow it out like I've done it here, but it just leads to more errors because if you don't cube it, if you don't convert every dimension of distance in your volume uh, separately, then you're just not gonna get the right answer. And you'll wonder why are you off by a factor of 100 or 1,000 or whatever it is. So 1.140 times 10 to the fourth kilograms per cubic meter, and that's the final answer. All right, so we're done with this lesson. I'd like you to solve all of these problems, and we're done with this unit. This unit was more of an introductory unit. It's just trying to get your uh, appetite ready to learn this stuff, and also to just try to give you some practice with dimensional analysis, because we're gonna be converting units all the time for almost every single problem. We'll have to convert units, or we'll just use the dimensional analysis to, to get our uh, self towards the answer, right? If I could give you one piece of advice as we move on and embark on this journey of learning all this cool stuff, it would be to try to cut yourself some slack if you don't totally see the solution ahead of time. When I first saw problems in physics, and if I didn't see the solution right away, I would get discouraged. And I would feel like uh, maybe I'm not good at this, or maybe I am not gonna do well at this because I don't, I don't see what to do like, like that. Well, that, that's a real problem because none of us are born with this stuff. You have to see examples to understand how to approach problems. Uh, you couldn't even count numbers without seeing a ton of examples. So it's true, some students pick it up faster, but really it all boils down to practice. So what we're gonna do as we move forward is we're gonna introduce each new concept. We're gonna not memorize equations, we'll try to understand equations and we will apply them to lots and lots of problems. Maybe you don't see uh, before I show you how we handle it in some of the problems, but I guarantee you that over time you will start to understand how to approach these things. You cannot learn a language without practicing and mumbling as a baby how to speak. You cannot learn physics or chemistry or anything without practicing and seeing examples. That's my advice to you. Cut yourself some slack. Don't get so stressed out if you don't see the path to the solution and stop trying to map out a path from the statement of the problem to the answer in your mind. Stop it, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I'm gonna read you a problem here in the next lesson and you won't be able to solve it in your head and you won't know exactly how to get there unless you write some things down. So, write down things, draw pictures, and we will together learn how to solve these problems and to get towards the answer. So, uh, solve these, follow me on in the next lesson and in the next unit, we'll continue to build your skills.